Hey, welcome tonight, guys. I'm going to kind of acknowledge online here. I know Lisa Carroll, you're probably out there. Stephanie's probably out there. Johnny, uh, Donald, Karen might be watching. Also for this class, we had Aaron Hitson sign up. We also had uh, Jonathan Sayer sign up. So hopefully you guys are tuning in. Uh, Sawyer, I want you to go in your Amplified Classic Bible. Did you bring it? Okay. 1 Corinthians 14.20. And who has a New King James? Do we have a New King James? I'm... Okay, Jordan. We're going to give you the New King James. I want you to go to... Isaiah... 28, 11, and 12. We'll all, now, let me, let me make sure I get you guys the... Oh, he's got the microphone. Before we go into prayer, this is the, verse, the, the verses the Lord gave me today, just talking about the importance of this again. I can't stress this enough. I'm telling you, I believe that praying in the Spirit is, was the success of Paul and his generation. I believe it was. I believe the reason he was able to reach so far and do so much and win so many battles. I mean, you guys remember the couple lists? He says, I've been beaten. I've been, you know, in the sea for a day and a half. All these different things he lists. And yet, how could we kept coming back? I believe praying in the Spirit is key. But So Sawyer, I want you to read uh, 14, 20, 21, and 22. Brethren, do not be children immature in your thinking. Continue to be babes in matters of evil, but in your minds be mature men. It is written in the law by men of strange, by men of strange languages and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and not even then will they listen to me, says the Lord. Thus unknown tongues are meant for a supernatural sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers on the point of believing. Well, prophecy is not for unbelievers on the point of believing, but for believers. So here he is in this verse that he, I'm going to have Jordan read here in just a minute. But in uh, Isaiah uh, 28, 11, and 12, Paul pulls that verse right out of the, the Old Testament, right in the middle of this. And according to context of what he's writing, this has to do with speaking in other tongues. It's like, well, wait a minute. Is that what he's saying? Evidently, it is what he's saying. And you guys get this. What do you do with verses like this? It says, tongues are not a sign for believers, but for who? Unbelievers. Well, then why are so many churches, well, you know, we might have people here that don't believe, so let's not speak in tongues. Isn't that the opposite of what the scripture just said? I can't find any, put it this way, over the years that we've just kind of let her rip chip, you know what I mean? Just let her go. Hey, it is what it is, right? This is the kingdom culture. I'm not going to apologize. This is what we do. You know, we pray in the Holy Ghost, we cast out devils, we heal the sick, fall into the power, all that stuff. It happens, right? And I, I have had more people say, I've never heard of this before. This is awesome. I didn't know this was available. And I told you the story about uh, when I was on a plane with a, a guy that preached to me trying to convert me to Islam for three hours. <laughs> and I'm, the whole time I'm praying, saying, you know, kind of going, oh, wow. Well, mm. You know, I'm just thinking, Lord, how can I help Abdul? How can I help this guy? And so I shared my testimony. And he kept correcting me in my testimony. Right? He said, no, 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 no. God has no son. I said, Abdul, this is my story. This is not your story. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but then I got to being filled in my testimony, being filled with the Spirit, speaking in other tongues. He says to me, what is this? What is this tongues? What is this speaking in other tongues? I said, you've never heard of that before. He said, no. No, never have. I said, it's a supernatural language by the Spirit that I speak out of my spirit that's recreated because of the life of Jesus on the inside of me. He says, oh, very interesting. I says, you want to hear? I mean, total unbeliever, right? So far, everything in my testimony didn't budge him. He's like, you know, still just, you, could, you know what I mean. You could feel the wall still up. And so I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just begin to worship God and thank God that for you, my friend, and that we're here in this plane and that we're safe, you know, whatever I said. I said, and then I'm going to go and I'm going to shift from my head into my heart. That's where the Holy Spirit is. And I have a language I'm going to speak. He was almost like, you know, the look of somebody getting popcorn. Okay. You know, <clears throat> and I just did that and I started speaking in tongues. 
you know, I don't know, seconds, 30 seconds maybe. It so shook him. He says, how, how could this be? How could this be? How could this be? I said, well, it's by the Holy Spirit. On the... See, something supernatural just happened, and it was a sign to him who was a what? Unbeliever. Unbeliever. See, so, I don't know, this is the tool. Just ask, ask the Lord more opportunities to use the tool. When you bump into people out there, I mean, in a McDonald's one time, a guy said, I've never heard of that. And, you know, he's struggling with his faith. I've never heard about that before in my life. I said, well, you want to hear it right now? I started praying in tongues, and he just all of a sudden come alive and said, now that is cool. Interesting. Interesting. Now, that verse that Paul mentions in Isaiah 28, 11, and 12, I'm going to have Jordan read that and look at the benefits of this. Go ahead, Jordan. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing yet they would not hear. Wow. Refreshing and rest is involved with this. Now, now one of the things I say to the Lord when I'm speaking is, Lord, I hear. If you're speaking to me in an unknown tongue, then I'm listening, Right. Because the Bible says what? Pray that you may interpret. You know you can interpret your own tongues? It takes faith. I don't do it all the time. But especially when I key in on it and I just, Lord, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to be involved with that right now. Bam. What you do is you yield. Just like in your heart you yield, you speak in tongues. Then you yield, you speak in English. It would shock you what comes out of your mouth. How many know what I'm talking about? You ever experienced that? If you haven't, do it. Right? But the benefits here are refreshing and rest. Anybody need any of that in your life? Yeah. Yeah. I told my wife this. Oh, they're just the last few mornings. Because I know the battle's on right now. I know you guys know this. That, that the, uh, the enemy in darkness is absolutely upset with everything that's going on right now. And we are in the biggest mission field in the country. Right? Well, we live on the south side of town, which is the headquarters of where they don't want you to be, right? And so, man, I wake up, and I'm just heavy. And I just go out, make myself... I've learned to ignore the devil, right? But, you know, if you're heavy, all that going on, don't, don't ever acknowledge it. Well, I'm just real heavy right now. Don't, don't, why would you say that? So what I do is I go out, and I get my coffee going, you know, get the cure going, and I just start speaking in tongues. Mm-hmm. Lord, and I start worshiping. Lord, I thank you. I thank you. All of a sudden, the presence starts coming. Well, what's happening? Refreshing's happening. Rest is happening. You know, I shared with you guys last week just about that strengthening grace. What I'm, what I'm telling you right now, just about this, we're going to pray in tongues for five minutes here. But this is part of that grace. Tapping into it. The scripture says here, he's speaking to us and he's giving us refreshing and he's giving us rest. Now, think about it. Is this something, is tongue something that you can initiate? Absolutely is. He said, Paul said, he said, I speak in other tongues, but I also speak with my understanding. I speak. I choose to speak. Right? Right? So this rest and refreshing, we're going to jump into some of this, but I wanted you guys to see that, that the Apostle Paul said a couple things. He said, don't be childish in this. Don't be childish. He says, understand, yeah, yeah you don't come into a service and everybody speak it in tongues. He's correcting that. But at the same token, to have it in there, in a service where people are worshiping in tongues or tongues and interpretation, or you're right here, you know, in your seat, worshiping God in other tongues, all that is appropriate. All that is, is not out of bounds at all. Why? Because there may be an unbeliever right next to you going, wow, that's kind of cool, but you're weird. What's going on there? I don't even remember when you first heard people speaking in tongues. Oh, man, I, I thought to myself, wow, what is wrong with these people? That was my first. And then, then here's my next impression. Wait a minute. The same spirit that was at Camp Baker when I was 13, when I got saved, it's in this room right now. 
I don't understand what's going on. I told Don Cunningham when I was taking him back to Fort Polk, driving from Derrida, Louisiana, to Fort Polk to drop him off. He said, listen, be real careful with those people. I said, don't be careful with those people. I said, you know, Don, I don't know all that's going on, but let me tell you, I told him about that same spirit in the room, and I'm going to find out. And I did. I don't know if he ever did. Right? You guys ready to pray? So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we launch out into the deep. And we thank you for refreshing and rest right now. Oh, Oh, 
Oh, la mane, ere, ejes, sabra bacarre andal mono, embren pentise quede, oh, roma talvasa, en sen telvara bacayo, cucura bacalacay. Woo, shu, met moyeha, nefrandicio met moyeha abacalaso, arramacuda, met descendide, embren ban del barra del basco, arramacura bacala basan del mar del bar. Em belenini ana casa fili, esci manduli an del barabacale hisi, send el matitis king king le dio suku, ora maka. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of praying with our spirit engaged with the Holy Spirit. Lord, it says on the day of Pentecost, they all began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Holy Spirit, we believe you for utterance. We're praying about things for our lives, our marriages, our families. In the name of Jesus, our church, Lord, our state, our country, the nations of the world. Lord, we're, we are open with hearts engaged to pray out the will of God. Thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for what he demonstrated. Those things, Lord God, that we've learned and received, heard and seen in him, we do. And the God of peace is with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't it good to be able to pray and just not have to have the answers in your head? It is. It is. I had somebody meet with me here. Oh, what was it? Just a few days ago. And it's like, man, I, I struggle in this area. And here's the thought. And I understand everybody has different thoughts on things. And, and I've never had this thought, but he did. He said, I know that praying in the spirit is very effective. He said, but, but this thought comes and says, you know what? You really, you really need to be responsible. And you need to pray and use this time praying for, you know, more things in your own understanding. Well, understand, I'm not against that. But at the same token, if you could pray things out and through that you don't know in other tongues. And I just begin to speak to him and just by the Holy Ghost, just begin to, to give him advice. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> Here's what I noticed. People that have a super analytical mind, it's a little bit tougher for them to click into this, bam, this world of praying in the Spirit. Matter of fact, one of the most difficult ones that clicking into this is a habit was Pastor Darrell. The reason is because Pastor Darrell is very, very analytical, but yet he just said, well, you know, it's in the Bible. So he just, okay, we're going to do this. But the joy that came... And the progress, because he was with us for years, so I saw the progress, bam, that came in his life ministerially because of this. While wow, you're praying out things you don't even know. Amen? You guys, want to look up here at the board. We're going to kind of do this. And uh, like I said, I don't know how much you could read this online, so I'll read it to you. And we've just been talking about the five expressions of grace. Kind of going to do this really quick in review. And then we're going to jump in, and we got two hours of teaching tonight, and then we're going to do one hour review. This is the fourth session, you know, three classes involved. And, you know, if you guys have questions, write them down now. We'll go over that in the last hour. But we got five expressions of grace. Now, understand, this book is an awesome book, but if we were to teach this book correctly, this could go like 24 weeks. Easily. Easily. There's so much in this book. Right. But it was so important. But these to me, I had to make the decision of what do I really, really want to, to, to impact on. So five expressions of grace. The first one is what? Saving. Saving grace. And then here it says saving grace in here. If you're watching online, keeps us from being lost. Saving grace keeps us from being lost. Also, saving grace. It's an impartation of God's forgiveness. Keeps us from being lost. Impartation of God's forgiveness. How, how many enjoy God's forgiveness? <laughs> oh, man. You know, I, I just today was studying and I ended up, you know, I don't know how you guys study, but it kind of pulls you. The Lord will pull me from here and pull me to there and pull me to here. And I ended up with Moses. He had Moses hanging out this morning. But the law, right? And the things in the law and, and 
all that God did in the law. It's all wonderful, but it was all so confining and so captivating, and so you better do it or else. And, and you understand that the whole purpose of the law was to take a covenant people and keep them from self-destructing until Jesus could come? That's what the law is all about. You read it in the book of Galatians. It says that, that really it's a confining force and, and you know, uh, filled with fear and pain. Would you agree? Fear and pain in the law. But it's confining you, right? But when Jesus came, no, no, no. You, you don't need that anymore because now he's dealing with the problem, which is the human spirit. So, again, saving grace keeps us from being lost. And then on the impartation side, impartation of God's forgiveness. What's the next one? Sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace keeps us from being contaminated. Is there any contaminating forces in the world right now? Everywhere. You know, uh, my wife, she, she uh, oh, there's, a, there's a, an old, old movie from years ago, and they did a remake on it, right? And it's called Death on the Nile. Remember you ever heard of that? It With Peru, Peru. Yeah. Well, they had a remake on that, and she thought, oh, man, this would be a great movie. What they introduced in that movie in the area of, now, that they weren't having sex, but they might as well have been. I'm thinking to myself, this is not, what are you doing? <laughs> See what I'm saying? Why? Because everything's about this contaminating force, right? That's against, that's trying to contaminate. Well, let me tell you, sanctifying grace, you know, on, on our remote, we got this thing called fast forward. It's like, oh, no, no. Okay, there. What's that? Yeah, or power. Yeah, now we have to do the power. If you, if you fast forward it more than this, like twice, you hit the power. Is this just, no, we're not going to do that, right? But this was a couple scenes. It was only a couple scenes. But still, it's like, why did you, why did you do that? Because the force behind Hollywood, the force behind all that is a contaminating force. That's what it is. So, Sanctifying grace keeps us from being contaminated. The impartation side, it's the impartation of God's holiness. You know that legally, on the legality side, you're not going to be any more holier than you are right now. Legally. Now, on the reality side, you could walk in more of it. You can. See, legally, the way God sees you in Christ... You're as holy as you're going to get because your holiness is his holiness. Your righteousness is his righteousness. But as far as reality walking out day to day, oh, yeah, yeah. That could become more of the real part of my life that's shining out and others are seeing. So, again, sanctifying keeps us from being contaminated. Uh, impartation of God's holiness. What's the next one? Strengthening. Strengthening grace. It keeps us from de being defeated. Do you think the enemy would like to defeat you and your family and everything around you? Has anybody lately and maybe the last year been through a situation where you knew going into it that the whole goal was to defeat you? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But what do you do? Well, <clears throat> do you realize defeat is one of the, well, If you're a believer, you're born again. Defeat is a choice on, of yours now. Pastor, what do you mean? Well, if you just stay in the game, you're going to win. I know Coco just had a win. He shared with me. He just came over and said, this is what's going on. Whoa! <laughs> That's a win. Well, uh, when you go through that, though, this little whispers, nothing's going to change. Yeah, 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 yeah. It goes on and on and on and on and on. But you have to get to the place. No, I, I like uh, Brother Copeland's attitude. He says, do you, do you understand that any trial in life is not like a baseball game? Baseball games, nine innings. At the end, who's ever ahead wins. Okay? That's not the way it is in the kingdom of God. So if it comes to the end of the nine innings and you're not ahead yet, you say to him, get back up to bat. <laughs> well, no, game's over. Nope, not over. Not over till I win. No, we're going to go into extra innings here, and we're going to play until I win. 
See, but that strengthening grace keeps you from being defeated. And it's a real grace, guys. I'm telling you, this right here. And a lot of what we just did, praying in tongues, that's a huge part of that, strengthening grace. Now, the impartation side is this, impartation of God's might. The Bible says that God would strengthen you with might by his spirit in your inner man. Wow. Yeah. You ever had or been in one of those places where, I mean, you, you are so tired and you're so wore out. And you, but you just draw on the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and I've told him, and Jordan knows, and a lot of those that have gone through camps with us, it'll be the best tired you've ever been in your life. But this is, a, it's an exercise for what? Strengthening grace. Strengthening grace. Because sometimes in the natural, it's like, okay. Uh, here we go. <laughs> but you know what? On the inside, stand up, Lord. Stand up. So, impartation of God's might. What's number four? This is, where we, this is where we left off last time. It's sharing grace. It's two things. Keeps us from lack and selfishness. Keeps, keeps us from lack and selfishness. Not just lack. Do you understand that the, the, the answer is not just Oh, God, I, I, it would be so different for me if I just had enough money. No, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't. It's not the way it works. You think it's the way it works, and the world tells you that's the way it works, but that's not the way it works. <clears throat> what goes with this uh, keeps us from lack and selfishness is that generous spirit. We'll talk about that uh, tonight. Generous spirit. Where it gets to the place where, man, I've had so many times where I'm just thinking, wow, Lord, I feel like I just got over the bump, Right? And then he'll speak to me and say, good, now I want you to do this. Something I really couldn't afford to do, whether it be in the church or in my natural finances. I've learned to go, okay, okay. Or sometimes it's, yes, it's the voice of the Lord, but it sure does sound a lot like Pastor Kelly. Because it's coming out of her mouth. You know? And I'm like, okay, babe, we'll do that. Let's get it. Let's pray. Let's do that. Right? So it keeps us from lack and selfishness, sharing grace. Also, the impartation side, it's the impartation of God's generosity. Is God generous? He says, while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. Not when we were his best friend. When we were sinners, when, when, when the whole world, here he is hanging on the cross, everything that's going on. And what is he saying? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's generous. I mean, now, that's Jesus. Let's back up to Father. How generous is he? For God so loved the world that he gave what? Now, only son means he's only got one. Wow. Wow. You know, here's a thought. Even though God the Father, it's just like in your life, he knows what the end is on this. But still, it's your choice. And Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, left his godhood, if you will, even though he never lost it, he's still God. But all the power he operated in as God, he left in heaven, it says in Philippians chapter 2. Right? And he came down, he's 100% God, 100% man. It, the Bible says in Hebrews, he has been tempted in every way, such as you, just like you. Think about all the way, ways people have been tempted in life. The Lord, all of it. Now, I, I haven't been tempted in every way. There's some things I've never been tempted with. I mean, not every way. Well, number one, I'm, uh, uh, there's things that women are tempted with that men aren't. I'm not a woman. I don't know that. Same thing. Women and men, right? Jesus, everything. Everything. So just think about it. Could Jesus have made choices and decisions that caused him to be successful but not go to the cross? Could have. Could have. You remember when Peter whipped the sword out and cut off Malchus's ear? He said, put the sword away. He said, don't you know I could call legions of angels right now and this would be over. But then I love his heart. But then how would the scripture be fulfilled? Wow. Because scripture being fulfilled had more to do with me and you than it did with him. What if he would have called out that day? Father, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. 
Yeah. Then all of a sudden, the angels would have delivered him, but all of us would have been over. Right? So, sharing grace, impartation of God's generosity. And what's the last one? <laughs> Serving grace. Keeps us from being unproductive. You ever meet an unproductive Christian? You, you think God knows of any? Oh, yeah, there's a lot. And we'll, we'll get into that. We're going to get into some of that tonight. I mean, we'll finish this class. But really, we're going to be going into that next class in this. The ministry of helps. Do you realize that most, most people in the body of Christ are in this ministry right here? In one form or another, everybody's in this ministry right here. Everybody. Right? And, and, but yet some, still, they don't get it. They, you know, God bless them. They, you know, the serving grace have never tapped into. They say things like, well, you know, I, I'm just not qualified nor trained to do that. Well, how do you think that people are doing it got qualified and trained? You just do it. You get in, you ask questions. Or, or here's one. I've heard this over the years. You know, I don't know. I'm just not comfortable with that. You know how many things that I have done in my life I'm not comfortable with? Wow. But here's what they don't know. And it's sad. They don't know there is a serving grace. If you get in it, right? It's like, wait a minute. What is this? What is this? It's serving grace. Serving grace keeps us from being unproductive. Now on the impartation side, it's the, get this, the impartation of God's ability. Ah, yeah. You know, it's, it's like this. How many here and how many online, how many of you are filled with the Holy Ghost? Now think about, think about the person of the Holy Spirit that's in you. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of God moved across the waters of the deep. That's the guy that's in you. Wow. So is there anything he doesn't know? Anything. He knows everything. So if he knows everything and he's in me, why do I have to know everything? I just have to, I, I need to know what I need to know and I need to know it, but he knows everything. But I, the reason I'm going over this is because I bump into people sometimes. They're like, oh, there's just so much I don't know. Well, yeah, but you got the one in you that knows everything. So you don't have to be down on yourself or, or oh, oh no, what if I witness wrong to somebody? Witness wrong? Is that even possible? To witness wrong? <laughs> what if they ask me a question I don't know? When somebody asks me a question I don't know, you know what I tell them? I don't know. Shocks them sometimes. What do you mean you don't know? You're the pastor. There's a lot of things I don't know, friend. I mean, I can look it up in the Bible, just like you can look it up in the Bible. But right now, I don't know. You see, because it, it's really relaxing to, to know that you don't have to know everything. I just know that God loves me. I know he said, if I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess him as Lord, thou shalt be saved. I'm saved. He said, if I can be filled with the Spirit, I'm filled with the Spirit. He's taught me how to get healed. I'm healed. You see what I'm saying? He, but he goes on and on and on. There's so many things in this serving part, this serving grace, that people don't tap into because it's totally available for everybody. Everybody. Uh, let me give you one too. People will say in their prayer life alone, they'll go, oh God, please use me. Use my life. Use me. Use me, God. Use me. Then, you know, we as a, as a staff will be plugging people in and, you know, it's busy and they're the ones that committed, right? And, and we have to watch it because there's some personality types. Oh, I could do that. I could do that. I could do that. I could do that. I know you can do that, but I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to burn you out. And I don't want to burn you out. And so sometimes people get that place where, Lord, use me, use me. And then they go, man, I just feel so used. I feel so used. Yeah, but didn't you pray, use me? <laughs> you, you prayed, use me, and then you're being used. And then you're complaining because you're being used. Amen? But yet, the, the answer sometimes is not, back off, the answer is serving grace. I just need grace right now, God. I need grace. And my wife, she's, she's a really good balance for me. Because, you know, a lot of times, you know, I, I don't know if you guys know, but the, what the Lord has allowed us to do, just as senior pastors, is pretty incredible. Because, you know, I have a lot of friends that are pastors, but yet they don't run the youth groups. They don't run, you know, the Momentum 30, 20, 30-something 30 groups. They don't do any of that. Well, we do all of that. 
But I'm not, I, don't, I don't complain. I just say, and I'm, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying that serving grace is huge on our lives. Huge, right? I mean, i uh, give you an example. We were, Kira and Gregory were down, and I'm looking around, and I'm just thinking, hey, man, Nadine needs, needs to get out the door, and I'm looking at stuff. Now, do you understand that serving grace will speak to you? No, I don't every time do dishes. I, I could, but I don't. But I just saw this needs to be done. Now, what was my attitude like? Yeah. You see why? It's serving grace. Serving grace. Otherwise, serving grace doesn't complain. Serving grace doesn't, why me, Lord? Serving grace doesn't do any of that stuff. Right? So anyway, let's jump into... we're gonna, we, right here is where we kind of ended last time. And we're going to jump right back in here on sharing grace. Right? Do you guys remember uh, on session number three, note number nine, what we ended on last time? Maybe you could find that in your notes. Just that sheet. Session number three, note number nine. It says sharing grace gives what? Freely. Freely and what? And cheerfully. And God measures the gift by the what? The heart, not simply the what? Come on. And you can see that in the ministry of Jesus. Do you remember? Jesus was so... These two words don't, don't seem like they go together, but they do. And I've met other people that are this way, and these words definitely go together. He was wonderfully eccentric according to humanity, not according to him. Wonderfully eccentric. You remember, remember when they were given offerings and the Lord was standing there watching? <laughs> Baskets here, and there's a line, and people are doing whatever they do, dropping in. And there's a woman there with two coins, two mites. I always think about her, right? Because think about all these people and these elaborate offerings and whatever they're giving, and she's got two coins, and you're in a line. You're moving up, right? Now, Jesus is watching. Now, many times the disciples are watching Jesus watch. Why? Because they're in. Jesus School 101. What is that? Follow Jesus, watch what he does. Right? So he's watching this, people putting this stuff, and then this woman comes. And I always picture her doing it this way. Because, you know, you just kind of kind of get up to the basket and, you know, and the Lord just, stop! Whoa! Whoa! Guys, you got to see this. And the, the guys are like, oh, what, Lord? He said, do you realize that this woman gave more than everybody here? See, it didn't have anything to do with the amount. It had to do with her heart. It had to do with the measure that was big to her. What the Lord was asking her to do. Right? You ever had the Lord ask you to do something you couldn't afford? If you have it, you will. Because in your mind, you think you can't afford it. But if he's asking you, he's got a plan. He's got a plan. <clears throat> when Pastor Kelly and I was getting ready to get married, you know, I just... You know, one of the things I learned is just women are just expensive. They just are, right? And so I'm getting re getting ready for this wedding, and and I went to a, a Charles and Francis Hunter meeting in Kansas City, right? And here I am in this in this meeting. I'm excited about it, and you know Francis Hunter, she's with the Lord now, but she was she's another one that was, she fits into that category, wonderfully eccentric, and she would just say, you know what, we're going to receive an offering tonight, but here's what we're going to do. We're all just going to ask the Lord what he'd have us to do, each of us. And so I'm sitting there, you know, it wasn't really a heartfelt, deep religious prayer. I just closed my eyes and said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then here's how he answered me in my heart. What do you got? I said, now, Lord, you're not asking me how much I got because you don't know. You know how much I got. And so I gave him a figure that I knew I had in the bank. And he said, that'd be good. Now, how many know that if I obey that or don't obey that, he's still going to love me? But he's teaching me something. He's teaching me something. Yeah. And so I wrote out that check, <laughs> folded it in half. When that offering went by, I'd love to tell you that I was a cheerful giver, but I wasn't. But I'm learning. I trust him. But here's what I didn't know. I didn't know how much money I actually needed about six months from then. And then six months from then, I just had supernaturally had a lot of money just coming in from different places. And I just thought it was odd. So I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, why is this happening right now? And he took me back and he said, do you remember when you were in that meeting? I said, 
Yeah. He said, you, you remember what you asked me and you remember what I told you? Yeah. I said, if you, he said, if you hadn't done that, I couldn't do this right now. He said, you set that in motion. I didn't set that in motion. I gave you an opportunity to obey and you did. Right? Now, in, he's only done that like once or twice in my whole life. Right? But in that case, it wasn't about the amount. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the amount that, oh, wow, I, I just gave it all to the Lord. No, it wasn't about that. If he, whatever he would have said, I would have de- done that night. But he's, that was the first time he ever said, how much do you got? <laughs> oh, but yet he's faithful. Now, I want you guys to, to go ahead and get out your sheet. We're going to start this session for note number one. Sharing grace starts in your heart with your measure. Your measure. What I mean by your measure, ever, all of us are in a place of faith right now that, that uh, it's a lot is relative. Big is relative. Right? But yet you're not responsible for my measure and I'm not responsible for yours. You're responsible for your own. Uh, Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. I'm going to read this out of this, the New King James Version. And I'm going to start really with verse 37. We're going to read verse 38, but I want to start with 37 because I like the way the Lord leads into this. Because yes, it's about giving as far as Money, you can, money fits in here, but it's much more than money. Life fits in this verses I'm getting ready to read. So Luke 6, verse 37 and 38, he says, judge not, and you shall not, what? Be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be what? Condemned. Forgive, and you will be what? Forgiven. Otherwise, what he's doing is he's showing you many areas in life that you're the one that sets this in motion, not him. He says, judge not, you'll not be judged. Uh, condemn not, you'll not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Then he says, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men put into your bosom. And then here it is. With the same what? The measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you. So here's the good news. In this area of sharing grace, your measure will increase or grow. It should. It should. You know, this may sound crazy to some of you, but I was sitting in a meeting one time. And uh, Kelly and I, you know, had we had just enough money to get to the meeting. You know, and I'm sitting there and I just, in my heart, I'm hearing this, this ministry that's just reaching the nations. I'm sitting there saying, God, this is your heart. This is your heart. This is your heart. And so what I did is I sit down. I opened up my checkbook. I wrote out a, I wrote out a million dollar check. I didn't put it in the offering. <laughs> but I wanted to write it to write it. See what I'm saying? I wanted to write it to write it. And I said, God, I want you to know my measure right now is at a certain level. But I'm writing out what, what I want my measure to be. I want to be to the place, and we'll get into some of this, I could give in to every good work. And, you know, Lord, I'm not there yet. But yet my measure is growing, and over the years it has grown. And I haven't been able to give a million-dollar check yet. So, Pastor, how is that going to come? I don't know. I have no idea. I don't even care. But I believe. I believe. I believe. How many believe God could do that for you? It's important that you do believe it, right? Right? I bump into Christian people. I don't believe in all that. Well, then don't worry. We'll not bother you your whole life. You'll be free from it. It's Part of it is adjusting your heart and your measure, saying, God, you know what? It, 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 it sounds crazy to most, and it's out of the box right now. But what I want to do is I want to increase by measure. Look at, look at note number two. Five things you have to settle... In your own heart. Five things. Talk about sharing grace. Number one is this. I put the numbers down there. Number one is this. What kind of God God is? You have to say that. What kind of God God is? What kind of God is he? 
Is he a stingy God? Is he a God that doesn't answer? Is he a God that may not be there for me? Is he a God that'll kind of leave me? What kind of God is he? And you guys can write this verse. I'm just going to read it. You can write the address under that question. And it's 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Because if you're going to find out what kind of God God is, you have to go to God's word. I'm going to read this to you. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might become rich. Interesting verse. Now, I've, I've seen people butcher this verse. Well, he didn't really mean rich. No, actually he did. Because our American mind gets involved, and all of a sudden the standards of what rich is come in. But all, it's, all it means is this, abundant provision. That's all it means. Does it mean a million dollars? Does it mean a billion dollars? Does it mean $100,000? Does it whatever big is to you? It doesn't mean any of that. It just means abundant provision. Think about this, guys. Jesus, for three and a half years, had how many guys, well, I'll put it this way, how many uh, apostles traveling with him? At least. At least 12. Would you agree? At least 12. Probably more, but at least 12. Now, we do know from Scripture that not all, but many of these apostles were married. So they had families, right? So we know at least four of them, four of them were fishermen. Well, they're not fishing right now. They're in Jesus 101 class, three and a half years. Do you think their sons, like, don't eat in three and a half years? I mean, Jesus is responsible for everybody on that team and their families. Okay, now, there's one guy on the team that was a treasurer. You know, you don't need a treasurer if you don't have any money. And it actually says that he, this treasurer carried the money bag. How many know who the treasurer was? Judas. Now, do you think Jesus didn't know he was stealing? He knew he was stealing. Now, how much money's in a money bag if, you, if you're supporting tw at least 12 families and there's a guy stealing out of it and there's still money in the bag? Wow. See, because with the Lord, by definition of rich, he had enough for everybody. Remember when it came time and they'd been there for three days and he said, you know what? I refuse to send these people away hungry unless they faint in the way. And I love it. <clears throat> they said, well, we have, I get this, we have one little boy's lunch. I'm like, there's no we in this lunch. It's his lunch. We have a little boy's lunch. Well, he took that lunch and he fed 5,000 men. And one translation says not including the women and the children. That's a big crowd. But he fed with one little boy's lunch. You see, Jesus had abundance in him, around him, coming out of him, everything. See, he has the same thing for us, right? Jesus, when he came down from the mountain after praying, all the boats were gone. So in our man mind, we'd say, well, I guess we really have to wait till the morning because all the boats are gone. Not, not in the supernatural mind. It's like, well, just walk. There's Jesus walking on the water. You know, Jesus demonstrated some things to us that absolutely are possible for us. Absolutely are. Right? But what kind of God is God? Remember we talk about he became sin with our sin? Right? He became a curse with our curse. He became sick with our sickness. He also became poor with our poverty. Wow. Wow. So we can be made rich or have abundance. But it's, you have to determine what kind of God God is. Because if he's an abundant God, it doesn't even matter where you are right now. Listen, where you are right now matters nothing. Uh, Pastor, you just don't understand. No, I do understand. I do understand. <laughs> right? It's just getting to the place, you know, and, and one thing, one of the things you never hear me do, you never hear Pastor Kelly do, we never whine. I never get up, wine, take offerings, never do. Oh, don't give. I just don't know if we're going to make it. No, we're going to make it. We absolutely will. You know how many ways he's come through supernaturally in 28 years? Now, I honor the ones that are giving. That's wonderful. But that's between them and God. That's why I purposely set up the giving in this church. I don't know who gives what purposely. 
Why? Because, you know, I'm a man, just like you're a human being. So whether you like it or not, you could, you could be influenced by that. And I saw that years ago. I said, since I could, then I won't. And I don't know. I had a guy, a young guy. Uh, oh, he's not a part of this church, but he's a good friend of mine. And, and uh, his dad's a good friend with me too. And they live in Lapine. And he says, uh, Pastor, he said, the Lord spoke to me about just during this pandemic to send you just a pretty good size offering. Did you get that? I said, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I believe we did. God took care of us. I said, but you heard from God, I guarantee you. Because during those times, there's a lot of stuff going on, right? We're like, Lord, trust you. Trust you. But you see, I believe that God is a good God. And I'm not only, I'm looking for increase so there could be more to give. More to help people. First one is, what kind of God God is. Second thing is, did he really mean what he said? Did he really mean what he said? You could put this. You could put this address underneath that. Did he really mean what he said? That's the second thing you got to settle in your heart. Numbers twenty three nineteen. Guess remember the story of Balaam and Balak. Balaam is one of the kind of the strangest dudes in the Bible to me, because he's not Jewish, but yet he's called a prophet. So, how? Who is this guy? Right? He ends up, you know being killed because he, he's an knucklehead but he was a prophet of God and then Balak called him and said listen I'm going to pay you well I want you to curse these people that are coming it was Israel right numbers 23 19 he stands up to Balak and Balak is there and they got the sacrifices ready it's like okay curse these people and then he blesses them and he makes this statement in 23 19 God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should repent has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Otherwise, did he really mean what he said? If you found out what he said, is that true? Yeah, settle it just like that. Yep, that's true. Pastor Kelly and I, was, we were uh, last week over at some new friends of ours dinner, and they were just telling the testimony. I love testimony. Testimony, and they're, they're about the same age we are, so they, they have four daughters that just... You know, they had to disbelieve God. I mean, you're talking, you know, and, and e even in our house. I mean, you know, I, I guess say I, I let Annie tell her own testimony sometimes, but it's just pretty amazing. We just had to stand, right? And there, she was telling Kelly about standing for her daughters. And she said, I got to the place where I just said, God, you said it. I believe it. That's it. And did it change in a month? No. Change in a year? No. Five years? No. Ten? No. Thirteen. 13 years, but bam, got exactly what they believe God for concerning their daughters. Well, God's faithful, but you have to get to that place. I like how Coco answered, you know, did he really mean what he said? Yes, true. He can't lie. It's impossible. Now, does that mean that sometimes you, it just, you know, you're going through emotions and it doesn't feel like it's so, and the enemy's hammering you? Yeah, all that's very, very real, but be very, very careful at that moment what comes out your mouth. You know, you could have tears running down both cheeks going, I believe God. <laughs> Done it. <laughs> I believe you, God, because everything in your emotions, everything in your, around your soul is just squeezing. You know what I'm talking about? This is real. But what do you do? No, no. I believe God meant what he said, and he can't lie. Third thing is this, is, is he really involved in increase in my life? Is he really? There's whole sections of Christianity that call what we believe, right, a prosperity gospel. Right? And you know what I tell them? You're right. It is. It is. Is, is he really involved in increase in my life? Is settling that in your heart, right? And, you know, think about this. When things don't change overnight, do you still believe it because he said it? Is, is, is he really involved with this? Okay, I, I understand he saves me. I'm born again. I understand he, he fills me with the Holy Spirit. I understand the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. I understand that. 
but is he really involved with this part of your life? So you got to get to the place where you find what the word says and you just have to believe it. Let me, let me read this to you. There's like three different, three different translations I'm going to read this out of, but you can write this down. 2 Corinthians 9.8. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Classic, then out of the Passion, then out of the AMP. Listen to this. Is he really involved in increasing my life? Here it goes. 9.8. God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance. Here's the first thing that happens. Now listen. So that you may always and under all circumstances, whatever the need, be self-sufficient. Possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. So first thing he does is takes care of you. There's a self-sufficiency. You know, this. let me read this part to you again. Possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work. Okay, this self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid, that's what's called independently wealthy in, in, in definition. Independently, that, that means that God can get you to a place. Now understand, you may be sitting here going, well, I'm just not there yet. No, but what do you believe about that? See, these are things you got to settle in your own heart concerning this, sharing grace. Keeps us from lack and selfishness. All right? Let me read this out to you out of the, uh, the Passion. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you have more than enough of everything, every moment and in every way. He'll make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do. Wow. Let me read it out of one more. This is the AMP. God is able to make all grace, every favor, earthly blessing, come in abundance to you so that you may always, under all circumstances, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything. Being completely self-sufficient in Him. And have abundance for every good work. An act of charity. You know, there's a couple that's really close to us that they're not serving the Lord right now. And uh, when it comes to things like, you know, buying houses or these kind of things, do you understand that, that it's important what you believe about this, even if it's, it's not in your hand right now? But you got to believe that the Lord's working in you. And this one person says to me, well, man... You know, the housing is just so expensive that, man, I just don't think we'll ever get in the house. How many know that's not what you want to say? Because Jesus said, whosoever shall say, don't doubt in your heart, believe what you say. You can have what you say. Right? Now, I understand they're not serving the Lord. I understand that. So I'm not judging them in a sense of, you know, ha-ha or any of that. I'm just, I'm just saying that, man, I could, I could see what they believe by what they say. And it's the same way for, with all of us. So when you get to the place and that number three, when it's, is he really involved in increase in my life? Yeah, he is. It says here, he's able to make all grace. Every earthly blessing can come to you in favor in abundance. Fourth, number four is this. Can he be trusted to perform? I mean, he says all these things, but can he really be trusted to perform? Write down this verse under that, can he be trusted to perform? Romans 4, 19 through 21. This is, our, this is the father of our faith, Abraham. Here's how he did this. Romans 4, 19 through 21. This is the, in the AMPC, the classic. It said, speaking of Abraham, he did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body. Okay, this guy's 99, right? which was as good as dead. He knew that because he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's dead and womb. So here, here's he's got. The Lord speaks to him. Even when they're young, they couldn't have babies. She was barren when they were young. Well, he found out that he wasn't because he ended up having Ishmael. You know, they got right in the middle and said, we're going to help God out. How many know that we're still suffering for that in the Middle East? Don't help God out. Right? So, 
you know, he gets to the place where God all of a sudden says to him, no, you're going to have a son. I'm going to come by this time next year and Sarah is going to be pregnant and have a son. And it says Sarah's in the tent and she laughs. <laughs> right. I love God. Guess what they named the child? Laughter. <laughs> she named the child that day. She's in the tent. Got the, oh, you think it's funny? His name's funny. Okay. So here, so Abraham, now he gets this word from the Lord. Now, this is, this is about the time when, you know, the God and the angels are going to Sodom and all that's happening, right? Now understand, when you're in the moment, you're in the anointing, you're, you're during worship, you're hearing the word of the Lord, there's a prophecy being given to you and it's alive and it's on fire, you're like, yeah! And then a week or so goes by and it's raining outside and your basement flooded and you know what I mean? You just got stuff. Kids aren't obeying, everybody's throwing up. Yeah, this is real life. Yeah. <laughs> then you, you get to the point where this thought, can he really perform that? Can he really? Is he involved with increase in your life? Can he really do this? So here he is. He hears from God. And as he gets away from this, it says, no unbelief or distrust made him waver or doubtingly, doubtingly question concerning the promise of God. It says, but he, Abraham, he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God, fully satisfied and assured that God was able and mighty to keep his word and to do what he promised. Wow. Aren't you glad that God doesn't give you things that you choke on right away? Here, remember the first thing he said to Abraham? Leave your, leave your father's house. Go into a land which I will show you. Okay. And then it works up to this one, right? I'm going to give you a son. And then, man, didn't you have a son? Woo! And then he says to you, I want, to take, I want you to take your son, your only son, the son that you love, and I want you to go to a place I'll show you. I want you to sacrifice him to me. Wow! <laughs> this is why he's called the father of our faith. <laughs> Amen? But still, can he be trusted to perform? You've got to settle that. One more, and then we'll take a break. Number five is this. God looks for cheerful givers and will not abandon them. you got to settle that. He's looking for you. He's looking for cheerful givers, and he will not abandon them. So write down this verse. God looks for cheerful givers, will not abandon them. Write down 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. This is the Amplified Classic. It says, remember this. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. He who sows generously, the blessing may come to someone, will also reap generously and with blessing. Let each one give as he's made up his own mind and purposed in his own heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. For God loves, he takes pleasure in, he prizes above other things, unwilling to abandon or to do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart's in his giving. God he loves that. But you understand that here in this area, he's not talking about tithing here. He's talking about he's asking you to do something. And, and it, the giving, yes, it could be monetary, but it could be time. It could be energy. It could be anything. Inconvenience. Right? When you make the, when you make the uh, decision, I'm going to do this, God, because you're asking me to. Guys, let's take a break.